like something. Give the Spirit gives life. They call the God is Spirit. Then we are told that in Him is life. And the life is the light of men. Then we are told in the book of John that Andrew Thompson, when he called his brother Peter and said, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. On who did he find, really? We have found him, the Spirit who gives life. But let me share with you an experience of mine. But bear in mind as I can. But if anyone should ever say to you, look, here is Christ. Or there he is, do not believe him. Don't believe him for the simple reason. When you find him, you are like him. Yet, one who has found him can bring you to him. But do not let him point to anyone other than yourself, who is the Christ. No matter who he is, how wise he seems to be, how powerful he is, don't believe him. There's no being in the world outside itself that you ever find as Christ. But you will find him. But when you find him, you are just like him. That's the place you are. Your face raised to the eighth degree of beauty and majesty. But your place. So here in him is life. And this life is the life of me. By him all things were made. And without him was not anything made that was made. Not anything, regardless of what it is. Twelve years ago, back in New York City, I tasted of the power of the age to come. That power that you and I will share together as one when we're all awake. It's a fantastic power. But since that day across the country, as I would tell the story of my experience of this power, one question was always asked. I was unable to answer that question, say, from speculation. But they did not wish me to speculate. Did I know from experience? I did not know from experience. I only knew from experience the positive side of this power. I did not know the negative side. And I met no one in my travels who had experienced either the positive or the negative until this past spring in LA. So I will share with you first the positive side that was my experience, and then the negative side that was this lady's experience down in LA. As I told you, it was 12 years ago. And I was taken in spirit. And I came upon a scene, a perfectly normal scene, just like this. But it was in a New England town, about 200 years ago. You see, nothing passes away. That scene was just as alive, although if you had lived 200 years ago, to you it would have been the only reality. And the past relative to it would not exist, and the future relative to it would not exist. Only it would exist. And today this exists, and we think because it was 200 years ago, it has ceased to be. But I know it hasn't ceased to be, because I came upon it. Are these things in any way interfering? Well, I came upon this scene. It was a restaurant. It was an early, I would call it a Sunday afternoon. I felt the atmosphere of Sunday. They were all dining, a very early dinner. There was an enormous bay window looking out upon a pastoral sea. Lovely trees, waving grass, a bird was in flight, and a family of four, two young men in their early twenties, and I did take it that the lady and gentleman present were their parents. They were in their early forties. 
a waitress is walking towards the table with what I took to be a second course, because they were drinking soup. The young man of about 21 or 22 facing me had brought the spoon almost to his mouth, just about here. As I came in spirit into this place, I knew that if I could arrest within me an activity that I felt, that everything within my focus would freeze. No sooner did I know it than I tried it, and I stilled in me an activity that I felt. As I did so, everything froze. The diner's dining, dying not. The young man couldn't move the spoon beyond where I had arrested it. The waitress walking, walk not. The bird flying, flew not. The little grass waving, wave not. The leaves falling, which I could see before I arrested it, fell not. And everything froze as though I came into a museum, and these things were suspended by invisible threads. It seemed that way. Then I investigated. I went close and looked at these people, and they seemed to me dead. They seemed to be not alive. They could have been made of clay. Everything was frozen. And then when I had satisfied myself that they were really dead, or they appeared to be dead, then I released within me an activity which I had frozen. As I released it, everything moved on in its course. The waitress walked. The young man completed the action of taking soup. The bird completed its flight. The leaves began to fall. The, uh, the little grass began to wave once more, and everything once more became animated. Well, having had that experience, I realized that life was in me, that life was an activity of my own wonderful imagination. Well, the Bible calls it spirit. For he is spirit, and in him is life. For I discovered what life really was. I arrested an activity in me, and they were not alive. I released that activity in me only then, and they were once more animated. I reanimated the entire scene. I discovered that what they call laws of nature, like gravity, is only, I would say, it's not really an absolute law, because for it an absolute law, the bird in flight should have fallen when arrested. The leaves should have continued. They should not really be suspended in space. But at least the bird in flight would have fallen, but it didn't. And the moment I released it, it continued in its flight to fulfill its purpose. I can see where the waitress would not fall. I can see where the four diners could be arrested and yet not in some strange way denied the law of gravity, but not the bird. However, as I saw it, my entire concept of life as I knew it changed. So I told that story across the country in the major cities as I visited these cities. One question that is always asked is this. Were the poor diners aware of the fact that they were frozen? Was the waitress aware? Well, I couldn't answer. I didn't know. I only knew as far as I'm concerned they were dead. They were frozen. And they seemed not only to be inanimate, not to be devoid of any possibility of ever being animated until I released it from within me. When I released that activity, which now I know to be life, they once more became alive. Well, this spring in LA, this couple, they live on the beach, on Malibu, and it's her custom to go walking every day on the sands. And this day in question, as she was walking, looking out to an animated ocean, I'm seeing people on the beach walking, and everyone a normal, normal way of living. And suddenly, and these are her words. She said, never suddenly, as I'm walking the animated, not an angry ocean, but quite a live ocean, suddenly someone or something turned me off, and I was nothing. These are her words. The ocean was nothing. The people were nothing. Everything was nothing. I stood there aware of being nothing. Then whatever turned me off, or whoever it was that turned me off, turned me on again. And then once more I became someone. And the ocean something, and everything round about me once more became 
how to make it mean something. Now, I can answer that question based upon her experience. I had the positive experience of life in myself, where I arrested it and turned it on again. But I didn't know that when I arrested it and the four diners stopped and were still in their tracks and the waiters were still and the birds still, that they had the experience of being nothing. So now I know that that's our future, to actually taste of the powers of the age to come. Then it throws light on the great trial of history. For well, here is the embodiment of truth, the embodiment of life itself, but key low on our level. And he stands before the personification of reason in this world. And reason asked him, where are you from? And he did not answer. And then Pilate said to him, do you not know that I have the power to release you or the power to crucify you? He said, you would have no power over me had it not been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you, he has the greater sin. That there was no power here whatsoever unless animated from above. That from above spirit animates this entire field of recurrence. And we have our intentions. It could be arrested as this lady herself. And she felt herself to be nothing. And then someone who turned it off, turned it on. And once more she felt she was something. Now bearing the book of John, in him was life. And life was the life of men. But the life was in him. And our consciousness is simply the light turned on. When he turns it off, the light is turned off, and we are nothing. Now, it is in him that is life. By him all things are made. Without him, there was not anything made that was made. So now I can introduce you to it. I do not look outside of yourself to find him. You're going to find him within yourself. You may not see him. Actually, as I described it last night, telling you the story of you and telling you the story of my own experience that I encountered myself in deep meditation, meditating me, making this thing an animated form that moves across this creator's space. But here, if he makes all things, good, bad, and indifferent, and without him, not one thing was ever made. Well, then let us tell you the story. A gentleman writes me that 19, in 1933, he was sailing on the Danube from Vienna to Budapest. But when he came into Budapest, the lights were on. It was quite late. He was so startled at the sheer beauty of the lights of Budapest that he had an intense look always capture that, and promised himself that when he returned to America, he would look all over to find a place that would give him just such a view or something similar. He returned to his home in Missouri, and then moved on to Southern California. And there in the hills of Southern California, there was a view of that fabulous basin when it's all lit up at night, as he described it like some wonderful lady of the evening with all of her jewelry on. And it simply stunted. He saw nothing. Well, he bought a place with that view. Tore up the side and placed an enormous window so he could always see the view. Then, ten years ago, the one below him where I planted a huge grove, maybe, of poplar trees. And he knew in time the poplar trees would grow and obscure his view. He knew it. Well, the time came, which is only about a year ago, that the leaves came and the branches came and the view is obscure. In the meanwhile, he started coming to my meetings. He's been coming two years now. He said, I will apply this principle of imagining. Imagining creates reality. I will stand here at this window and with my eyes shut to the obvious, I will see the view that I have seen for years. The view I fell in love with first back in Budapest, and the view I fell in love with here when I first saw it. 
and for one solemn leap, he simply saw what formerly he remembered seeing. I told the story of I Remember Prayer, which was a vision of mine to share with those who would come to my meetings. So having remembered my vision of I Remember Prayer, I think you've heard that vision of mine. And for one solemn leap daily, he would look and see the sight that he ought to see if the doctor trees were not there. In one month, the poplar trees died. Every tree that dropped the side died. Not all the poplar trees, but every one within view of that actually died. At first it was a shock. Then he said to himself, no, love cannot kill love. And life cannot kill life. Life simply has rearranged itself to conform to the image of my mind. Here he discovered Christ. He said, but Christ wouldn't kill. He must listen carefully to the words. He does everything. I kill, I make alive. I will, I heal. I create the light, I form the darkness. I do all things. There is no, no God but God. For if these things died before his very vision, well then they die. The man below had, for insurance purposes, to remove the trees. So he removed all the dead trees. Then he says, I had a cat. I loved the cat. And the cat tore all of my lovely rugs apart. And all of my lovely chairs apart. I really loved the cat. I did not get new rugs immediately for the simple reason that when I was hoping that she would die. She was 15 years old, but she seemed to be, to be, to be determined to outlive Masood Medusa. So here, the cat didn't die. He didn't want to kill the cat. He just wanted the cat to be trained. So he imagined the rug in the backyard, which the cat had never used. The cat was 15 years old, and he had that cat for 15 years. That the cat was on the outside, tearing everything apart from that rug. Three days later, the cat went out and started using the rug instead of the cars. And to the day she died, it never once came back and tore the rugs. But now he is found Christ. Because in him is life. He took life from the trees and rearranged them. Here was a cat performing a certain action for 15 years. What a habit formed. And in three days, that habit could be broken. And remained broken until she made her exit from this world. On a gentleman in the audience, when I told that story, it never occurred to him to try it until that moment when he heard the story. Well, he had a problem similar to the poplar trees, only there were not poplar trees. Seated at his dining room table, he used to feast upon a scene across a valley. And suddenly, the next door neighbor planted bamboo. Trees. The bamboos came and blocked off the entire city. He didn't tell his wife or the neighbor what he was doing, but he would physically seat himself at the table and then look off into space and remember what he could see before the trees grew. And he saw it clearly in his mind's eye, and for one solid week, that's what he did. But when he came home, beginning of the second week, his wife met him and said, do you know what has happened today? Our neighbor has removed all the bamboos. It was his urge. He thought he initiated the desire to completely change all the backyard and remove all the bamboos. He did not have to go next door to the neighbor and persuade him to do the gracious, decent thing as a neighbor. He didn't tell the wife or so because she might have done it. He simply sat there quietly and looked and he saw what he would see if there were no trees there. So here are two. He found Christ, for only Christ can make a thing. Now a third party. He said, I have a little girl eight years old. I got thinking I'm not doing enough for my child. I don't see her enough. I should spend more time with her. That was all that he 
said to himself. Then he said, you know, I'm very fond of jet flying. So one day, I thought I would enjoy an imaginary flight. I found myself getting ready with my little girl and my wife. We were all getting ready to go off. We could go flying. But strangely enough, as we went through the door, only my little girl seemed to aid my imagination. She had never flown before. So I didn't drive the streets. I found myself right at the state at the uh, airport. I'm explaining to my little girl all the things about an airport. Incoming planes, departing planes, weighing all the baggage of all these things. Then instead of walking up the ramp, I found myself on the plane. I placed my little girl in my imagination at the window. Then I felt the takeoff. And here I am describing to her the things below on the ground, the buildings, the sites, all these things to her, and then I broke it. That was all. A month later, I said to my little girl, Lynn, I said, Lynn, on April the 11th, it is Father's Day and Daughter's Day. Father's Daughter's Day. So that day, you and I will spend together, just the two of us. What we will do, I don't know. But it's a came the morning of the 11th of April. And my wife is dressing, my little girl is dressing, I'm dressing. But it's just for living myself. But we went through the door together because my wife had a date with a beautician. And then we parted company at four. I went to my car. I thought, well, what will I do with Lynn for the whole day? Well, I will go and have breakfast dress. And I'll take her to the beach. And following a lovely time at the beach, I'll take her to lunch. After lunch, I'll take her to the movies. So I got on the San Diego freeway. And there I am, tearing down on the freeway, when suddenly a feeling possessed me that I could not shake. And that feeling was to get over to the airport and take a jet to San Diego and go to the zoo. I went over to the airport, got on that jet with Lynn. Here I am in the San Diego Zoo. I'm almost at the end of my trip. And it dawned upon me what I had done in imagination. The very thing I had done, say, six weeks before, now comes to fulfillment, I didn't recognize it when it happened. He found Christ. I hope by these stories, without tasting of the power of the age to come, you will recognize Christ in you. For it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Not any Christ of history. So when you hear the word Jesus, you make a mental image of being upside of yourself. When you hear the word Jesus Christ, if you think of something on the outside that lived in time and space, as unnumbered tens of millions do, then that's not he. You haven't found him. When you find him, you think of no one but that presence within you that brings everything into being in your will. He's always brought it, he's bringing it, and he always will bring it, and there is no other Christ. So when you hear the word, automatically check yourself. What do you think of when you hear the word Jesus Christ? If you make any mental image of another other than yourself, you have a false image. Do not believe. So if anyone should ever come to you saying, look, here is Christ. Or look, there he is. Do not believe. But in spite of that, unnumbered crowds who believe themselves as students of the Bible will jack you up on it and think that you are arrogant. And any claim on your part, but make no claim, is simply blasphemy. Yet there will never be another Christ in your life. So I can introduce you tonight to him. As Peter was introduced by Andrew, Andrew found him first. Andrew discovered what he did to discover the creative power within him. Who knows, it's not recording. But Philip did to discover it, and to bring Nathaniel to it, it's not recorded. But it is told in story form. A man in a strange way has misunderstood the story. I know how he calls the grand parable history. It isn't history, it's divine history where this thing really comes into being in us. As he comes in us, be tested. Come test yourself and see. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in thee? Unless, of course, you fail to meet the test. For well, these three met the test. Unnumbered hundreds across the country are meeting the test. They may go back through habit and find now they need some other comfort or some greater comfort in the believing of another. I ask you.
to find in this light, trust in this light, and take any problem in your world and exercise the Christ in you before you taste of the power of the age to come and see if he doesn't bring that thing into your world. For by him all things are made. Without him there is nothing made that was made, nor will there anything be made to more by any other power. The only power in the world is Christ. In him is life, and that life is the life of men. And you will one day have the experience of shutting it off and watching people stand still. And if you remember tonight's message, you will know that they are saying within themselves, I am nothing. Absolutely nothing. As they have become aware of what was and how many good men, it is still, it is nothing. And then you will turn it on again. And all the room as they intended before you close it off. And that's the whole vast world in which we live. So when I said this is an animating field, we understand the ape of Romans. We were made subject unto futility, not willingly, really but by the reason of the will of him who subjected us in hope. That the creature will be made free or set free from this bondage to corruption and obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. When that something is set free in man, he joins the heavenly host and he is gone with it. And tomorrow you and I will actually be controlling and animating this being that goes on forever until that moment in time when one is right to be awakened and be detached from it. Another moment, another one detached from it. And we are the ones who will be doing it. Before we are actually detached from it, we taste of the power of the age to come. So here, if you are not with us, when I tell you my vision, for the noise of that. Second dream, as I entered the mansion, 
seen the same people I am his grandfather. And I turn to the two generations present, and I would tell them, I remember when this was an empty lot, and when I fainted and were rich of my desire for that lot. So I told that story to the audience in LA, I don't know where I go, for it means it is a true vision when the thing is done, as told in the 41st of Genesis. So the strength of that, many now are taking that system as it were, by saying to someone or saying of someone, I will not to win. They were unemployed. If, if they, they are unemployed, but in their minds are, I remember when he was unemployed. If I remember when he was, I am implying he is not now. I remember when he didn't make 10,000 a year. If I said I remember when he didn't make 10,000 a year, I am implying he makes in excess of 10,000 now. If I want to push it up, I can say I remember when he did not make 20,000 a year. That would imply his income is in excess of 20,000 a year. I remember when he was just a weekly. I am implying he is not a weekly any longer. So you can take this technique and apply it to anything in the world. I remember when she was madly in love with one that I disapproved of. I remember when I could even raise the question because she would not listen to me. Her father and I disapproved completely, but I thought it was her love affair, and so what could I do about it? But I remember when that was a problem. Therefore, it's no longer a problem. You can take the same attitude towards every problem in the world and bring about the solution. I remember when he had a new name. If I remember when he no longer had it. And you can do this with everything in the world. Now, this is something that I did not induce. Visions are things you do not sit down and induce at will. No power in the world can sit and induce a vision. A vision to me is truth unmodified by the conceptual mind. You don't rationalize it. You don't sit down and think about it. It just happens. And we are told in the book of Numbers, if there be a prophet among you, I the Lord will make myself known unto him in vision, and I will speak to him in a dream. For the Lord is not a liar. So he speaks with you in a dream, but then listen carefully. And when the Lord repeats the dream, it's for a great purpose. He tells you that is now fixed, and go out and tell it. Tell it as though you have received it, and everyone heard it as you received it. For the thing is now fixed by God, and God was taught to bring it to pass. But since I started telling that, I can't tell you the most wonderful stories, the most fantastic results that people apply. For they apply it in a, in a simple way. They think of someone that they know, and mentally carry on a conversation with another. I remember when, relative to the other, I remember when he was terribly disturbed because of a certain problem. And look at it now. For that would imply he is no longer disturbed. And take any problem in the world, and then face it and remember when. And it's no longer that problem. So here, this man remembered when he could see across the valley one mile away, that wonderful landscape valley. And then the man next door has the courage to cut down all the bamboos. I remember when I saw Budapest. I remember when I could see the entire valley, this grand vision for the sentence, and see it so vividly at night when it's all lit up. I remember when, and the trees die. I remember when that chap used to tear up all the plants in this place. He no longer tears any while it goes back into the backyard and uses a little mat for its purpose. And so you can take any problem in this world and feed it. With this little technique, I have been under the way. Try it. When it works, you will find Christ Jesus. And who did it? You will say within yourself, I. And who is doing it? How will you say, I remember the I am. Well, that's his name. The word I am is Jesus. The word I am is Jehovah. Jehovah is Jesus. Jesus is Jehovah. It's one. God he came. As I am, that I may be as He is. God became as we are, that we may be as He is. He isn't pretending that He's us. He actually became us until He awakens in us. Let us test His power and 
see if we can't bring things into this world that seemingly are seemingly impossible. Like 15 year habit of a cat, that's an impossible thing. And to have a habit of that nature of 15 years, broken in three days, without raising a finger to do it, is not an impossible thing. Though with God, all things are possible. It may be impossible to man, but that man didn't do it. He sat them quiet in his mind and saw, and saw the cat on the outside, tearing up the flaps of the space there for the purpose to sharpen her nose or nails, but not his lovely rough. And suddenly the cat goes out and performs the act which in his mind's eye he saw. Who did it? Well, only Christ could do it, therefore he found Christ. So here next time, I hope you will come. At least I've introduced you to him, but there's no compulsion like that to make you accept him. So many people find it will comfort him to go before a picture on a wall or some piece of little marble resembling a human form and worship it. Although we are drawn all through scripture to make no graver image unto me, but not many will still do it. I was on TV myself with this panel of mine. And this archaeologist came on, and we had two ministers, one Baptist and one Adventist, and plus this uh, archaeologist. When I told them about my experiences, of course, they did that to them because that is not the way they understand the great, the great Christian mystery. That isn't so at all, as far as they were concerned. Then as the hours went on, it's a two hour plan, two hour show. This archaeologist takes some huge big canvas. And he begins to unveil it before the cameras are. And here he is telling us that this is an actual picture, but the actual picture of Christ Jesus, that the lights coming through have actually gone up on some kind of a floor and left the imprint. I said to him, I shouldn't have done it because that's the one kind. I said, You are an archaeologist, I do accept that. I said, No, you two are ministers of the word, as you say. Aren't you told that unless you look like him, that's not he? The word is that in the book of John, the first epistle of John, the third chapter, that there it does not get appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. I said to the archaeologist, do you look like him? Do you think he resembles what you're looking at? You don't, I don't, and they don't. And yet you dare to tell this vast audience through TV that this is an actual picture of Jesus Christ? All the ministers want to go along with that. They want to go along with that. They want to believe in something outside of themselves with whom they can turn. So few will accept the true Jesus. They haven't the courage to actually accept him and live in his name and only call upon his name and his name is I. That's his name. So it's still calling with the name called Jesus, Paul, say, I am, that's how you do it. And say, I am this, I am making the cat, what am I doing with the cat? I am seeing the cat upside now, that's what I'm doing with the cat. And the cat takes three days, all right, so it takes three days to break a 15 year habit. And what you're doing now, I am seeing the beautiful scene across the valley. What scene? But don't you see it? Well, I'm saying that I am seeing a beautiful scene across the valley. But you can't if he's had it with anyone else. Look at the trees blocking your view. I am seeing the sea. And they die. And then I'm seeing another sea. And the man chops them down. I no longer believe for one moment that he who is seeing it is exercising Christ. But I will tell all of them, you wait. The day will come, maybe tonight. You will taste of a fantastic power. The power that animates the whole vast dream of the house and turns it on its axis. And the day will come, you'll be detached from it. And you will be among those who are turning it and watching evening for the word to hatch out. As the word is hatching out, the very one in whom it hatches, you detach it. Let him walk the wheel for a little while longer. And when he makes his exit, having gone through all these scenes, he is detached, detached permanently, and he will join the heavenly host. And then everyone in time is connected one by one, not in groups, all one by one. So here, the Spirit gives 
coming out of the body of Jesus is my body. Now here is a man, you would walk too well by the use of his imagination in business, and would give the whole thing up for the ecstasy of these mystical experiences. But he does not think about anything. He has come Christ. And Christ within himself, who can take care of his family beautifully, and still have these expanding, wonderful mystical experiences. Now he is the cat, the father of the little girl. So here all these things are taking place in our wonderful world as we go from coast to coast, telling the story of Christ Jesus, telling everyone who will listen who he is. He is housed in man as man's own wonderful human imagination. So when you say, I am, if you're in pain, it is Christ in pain. If you say, I am, if you're in love, it's Christ in love. If you say, I am, at the moment you're depressed, it's Christ who's depressed. Then go back and read the 53rd chapter of the book of Isaiah. The great suffering servant. He suffers in every man who suffers. And rejoices in every man who rejoices. And the day will come, he will rise in man. And man rises with him. And it's the man who is rising. He so completely gave himself to man. Only that man rises. Not to one rise. And it's you. No alteration in identity, no change in identity, but for all the sameness of persons, a radical, radical discontinuity form. And the form is the form of God. Although you cannot see it in your fly, it's the form of God that will trouble you when you are detached from this thing. So tonight you take this technique, I remember when. I remember playing, and they just put it, anything on it. It's the night you deny ecstasy for a certain club, and you would like to join a certain club. I remember when they wouldn't accept me. I remember when I was not a member. That would imply you are a member, if you so desire it. I remember when, I mean, fantastic things can happen with that one simple little technique. I remember when. But anything in this world about it. That statement in itself came to me from the depths of my soul through vision. The story of grandfather and the second experience of the same night, I was grandfather. And standing on an empty lot, I could say, I remember when this was an empty lot. And then take my word picture for of my desire for that lot. And the lot came visibly before those to whom I spoke. Let us go into the silence now and use the technique I remember when. Now, all the questions, please. Where did we come from? All things come from God. There's no other place, no origin of planet God. No origin of planet God. If I could quote for you, Sir James Jeans, he said, look at this fabulous universe. He was an astrophysicist, by the way. He's been asked the question time and time again, what makes you think, because you're an astrophysicist, that there's only life on Earth, life as we know it, a meaning, biological life, called man, earthly man. Because he maintained that after all of his studies, looking through the telescopes, using his mathematical concepts of life, that he couldn't find any part of the entire vast universe suited to house what we call man. But no place in the universe as an astrophysicist, and he is still to this day considered one of the truly great astrophysicists of all time. This is the James Jeans. And he wrote a little book called Man and the Stars. And the one who questioned his right to say that no place in God's fabulous world could harvest and pray for man, but then he said, I've been with a scientist all my life. Let me now share with you my own experiences, even under the microscope. I use the telescope to examine the heavens. I use the microscope to examine the little minute things of life. And man, in his attempt to reproduce himself, Exposed visions of potential men. And one will come out. This is God's explosion. And one could credit his purpose, which is man. That 
If I don't accept the incarnation, one who was born with a hunchback or deformed in any way, it would prove an unjust God. My dear, to me, God plays all the 